morning. My name is Kenny Lee, and I just knocked my pop shield off. I'll put that back on in a moment. I'm the pastor here at Marble United Methodist Church on behalf of our congregation. If you're a visitor with us this morning, we're so glad to see you here to be able to share this time and space with you. This is an exciting time in the life of the church where we're going through the Easter tide season, and so we're very privilege that you chose to be here with us this morning. We want to welcome you. Hope that you have a divine encounter today. Before we begin our worship service, I want to invite you into a moment of prayer with me. Holy God, we thank you and praise you for your Holy Spirit that has brought each of us here. God, we need you. We need your spirit. We need to have a divine encounter today as we sing the songs of praise, as we offer you our prayers, as we open up your holy word. God, draw us into that divine encounter. Change us, Lord, from the inside out. Through the power of your spirit, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's help us police that so they don't ruin their good clothes. <laughs> I want to invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of praise, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Christ. 
as the one who has saved us, who has found us and delivered us from slavery to sin and death. Lord, every week we read a substantial list of names, every person whom you know intimately, inside and out. God, we give you thanks because we know that even though you already know the desires of our heart, you already know our needs, that, that you call us, that you invite us into your presence and ask us to pray persistently to offer you those things that we are anxious about, those times and places and people that we would pray for, oh God. For those in our midst who are sick, we pray that through the ministries of doctors and nurses and through the unlimited supernatural potential of your Holy Spirit that you would reach down and you would touch their bodies and that you would facilitate healing and wholeness in their lives, Lord. Restore to them not just their bodily health, but a complete holistic health, your shalom. Lord, for those in our community who have lost loved ones, we pray today that you would give them your peace, your presence, that they would know the very person of Jesus is right there with them, sitting Shiva, listening to their grief, being silent and knowing that they are loved. God, you may prompt one of us to be present with them as well, to offer a word of comfort, to bring a meal, to send a card. Help us to be the body of Christ in this community. For those whose lot in life has made them more vulnerable during this time of pandemic, we pray for them, Lord. We pray for the country of India, where thousands of people, hundreds of thousands every day, are newly infected with the coronavirus. Lord, for those people, 90% of whom work day by day to feed themselves each day, people who are going hungry because they're unable to work. God, put it into our hearts to do what we can to reach out to offer the love of Jesus Christ. For those in our community, our families, our neighborhoods who don't know you, Lord, teach us to be salt and light in order that people might come to Jesus. God, we thank you for your presence in this place, for your love, your mercy, and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. taken received her in a different way during this time of COVID. Those plates will be placed um, at the exits. We ask you to drop your check or offering envelope into those as you leave the building or perhaps as you enter. Um, if you'd like to make an online donation, if you're wor worshiping with us virtually, and sometimes we kind of lose track of that, don't we? We're, we've gotten used to the tripod and the smartphone, and we don't realize that hundreds, maybe thousands of people are watching right now what's going on. I promise you, as the person that's up front, I'm acutely aware of that. If you're with us today virtually and you'd like to make a donation, you can go to our website at umcmarvel.org and push the donate button, complete that transaction with your credit or debit card. But more importantly, I want to remind each of you that your offering is, is a sign of your good stewardship, the things that God has placed in your purview and that your contributions continue to help us keep the lights on, pay salaries, but also to reach a lost and dying world. I want to invite you to stand as we sing the doxology. <coughs>
comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and I'll begin reading with verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into a fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciple. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. God. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the living out of this word that we share. John writes to a community who at the turn of the first century A.D. is beginning to be feeling very lonely and exiled. You see, um, Rome was the oppressive political force during Jesus' day, and there was an uprising about three generations, or about 30 years after Jesus' death, in, in which Rome completely destroyed Jerusalem, razed the temple, and dispersed the Jewish people throughout the then known Roman Empire. And because of that, Judaism was forced to completely reinvent itself. No longer does it have a cultic center, no longer are there high priests making the appropriate sacrifices day and night, and that Pharisee Judaism soon evolves into a rabbinic Judaism where the study of God's word and, the, and temple worship became the central facet of being a observant Jew. And John's community are beginning to be pushed out of that place of familiarity. You see, because of the, um, of the um, refusal of Christians to fight alongside their Jewish brothers in the war against Rome, um, they were being ostracized from the synagogue. There was a list of blessings and curses that were a, it was a liturgy that they said every morning in the synagogue service. And part of that was cursed be the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth, and cursed be those people who follow him. And so the Jewish people were intentionally pushing this sect of who they considered to be turncoats out of the synagogue. And in Jewish life, family and synagogue worship and being a part of the community is so central to life that it was like the worst fate that could befall a Jewish person was to be excommunicated from the synagogue and to cut off from their family to be landless and homeless. But that was the real and certain future that these people that John writes to are, are going through. In today's passage, this is part of the larger farewell discourse of Jesus and this all of this goes on and it's a substantial amount of scripture that goes on immediately following the Last Supper on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane where eventually Jesus will be arrested. And so on their way, I imagine, somewhere along their way between that upper room to in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, they pass a vineyard and Jesus takes this opportunity to use a metaphor, an extended metaphor, and says, I'm the true vine and you are the branches. And apart from me, you can do nothing. And the way that you'll know that you're branches and that you're being in, that you're intimately connected to me is that your your lives will begin to bear fruit. And so he uses, he really stretches this vineyard metaphor. He really works hard to try to help people understand. It helps us to know that in the Old Testament, that Israel often is referred to as God's vineyard. Um, and there's a place in Old Testament scripture that talks about how God plants this choice vine on a hill 
that's well watered. And he takes all of the rocks out of the soil and he carefully tends this vineyard. And this vineyard, instead of yielding sweet fruit the way that you would expect a choice vine to yield, it, it yields instead, it yields sour fruit. And, and this is very telling in, because God's been very careful with them and he has a mission for them. And their mission is to be a, a nation of priests so that other people will come to know Jesus, but instead their religion is either cast aside from time to time, depending on this very cyclical nature in their history, where they come to God and then they kind of drift away, and then God um, institutes something that kind of brings them to a crisis point, and then they come back to God. Does that sound like anything that's going on in your life? You ever found yourself to be not as close to God when everything is going well, but when things kind of get to a crisis point, you, you tend to kind of you tend to kind of snuggle up to God a little bit, right? You get a little closer. You want you want to be close, and you want to be close enough so that He can hear what your needs are. I want to share a passage of scripture from Isaiah, and this is Isaiah twenty-seven, and I'll begin reading with verse two. In that day. Sing about a fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. I'm not angry. If only there were briars and thorns confronting me, I would march against them in battle. I would set them all on fire, or else they would come to me for refuge and let, me, let them make peace with me. Yes, let them make peace with me. In days to come, Jacob will take root and Israel will bud and blossom and fill the whole world with fruit. Now we know that, that things got better for the people that Isaiah prophesied to, but I believe that this passage of Scripture, especially that last verse, is a direct reference to Jesus Christ. That there, Jesus is the true vine. So Jesus is doing what no other person was ever able to do. Jesus accomplished all of the 613 commands that are set forth in Scripture. Do you, have you ever wondered why there's so many 613? If you read that narrative closely, God starts out with just 10. And, and it's not 10 commands, it's 10 words. Ten, it's the Decalogue. And then Israel goes along and they say, oh, we can handle this, 10 commands. And then they, they start to blow it. And then God gets a little more specific. And then they blow it again. And God gets a little more specific even after that. And so finally it grows into this huge body of do's and don'ts. And, and a conveyance of the moral law that's still appropriate for us, right? We shouldn't murder. We shouldn't lie. We shouldn't steal. Now, we don't have to not eat shrimp or catfish. Because that's in there too, right? But for a good Jew, that, that, was, that was part of life. And they didn't eat pork. And I don't know, salmon probably start with that pork. Chops. I just made her a big butterfly pork chop last night. She ate the whole thing. <laughs> Jesus is trying to tell these folks, and he's trying to tell us today, that there's this intimate, organic connectivity that can only be accomplished when we're really close to God. And, and Jesus says, apart from me, you can't do anything. And, and those branches that aren't bearing fruit, they're, they're cut off and they're thrown down in the turn row and they're going to be picked up later and put in the fire. I, I did some research last night. I, I found it really interesting. I wanted to learn a little bit more about, you know, God is the vine dresser. God's the one that's tending the garden. Like Miss Penny said, God's the one going through deadheading the roses. Um, we just planted a couple of roses and we need to deadhead that new one. That, I got her a beautiful orange and red one. And, and so God is taking special care. We read that in that Isaiah passage. God is taking special care of the vineyard. And Jesus says, I'm the, I'm the true vine. I'm the one that is going to accomplish God's purposes. And the disciples are the ones that are going to bear fruit. Well, and there's, there's an emphasis in this passage, um, bearing fruit. And bearing fruit is like six times. Bear much fruit. Bear fruit. And there apparently is different levels. There's, there's branches that aren't bearing any fruit, and there's branches that are bearing some fruit, and there's branches that are bearing a lot of fruit. And, and, and the pruning that goes into that 
is a very, it's like a year-long process. A vineyard is not something you plant and then you get fruit from it the next year. A vineyard, a vine is not allowed to produce fruit for three to five years. So they're just tended. And these things, they come up and there's like this, they're the vine, the major part that's in the soil, that's, but it's not strong enough to support all the superstructure that grows out of that. So there has to be an arbor or a trellis, something that's going to support that. And, and the amount of the amount of pruning that goes into that starting in the in the winter time is amazing. So like 80% of all the growth on the vine from the year before is trimmed off. And, and the, they trim off everything that's above the top wire. So head high, they trim off everything. And then they start at the bottom and depending on whether they're growing two, two wires or one wire, they thin everything on each wire down to like two or three branches. Okay, and they cut even cut some of the length off of those, and they make sure that those branches don't extend past the part, so they're not encroaching on the other vines next to its face. And so they trim it back to two or three for each wire, and they wait till the last frost comes, and they go out there and they pick the two strongest ones, and they tie it to the wire. And, and if they're doing two wires, they tie it to all four wires. And then later on in the year, they come in and they pull some of the vegetative growth off. So all this stuff that's, that's not growing up, that's growing down, they pull all that off. And they move some of the leaves because they, they can already see where the grapes are going to come in. And they want that thing to be strong and vigorous. They have to cut all of last year's growth off of the vine because that is not what produces fruit. It's, it's the... the signs that come up the year before so they only keep the strongest ones of those and they only keep the ones that are closest to the vine because they're going to be the strongest and they count the number of buds on there the buds represent the the shoots that are going to come up that are going to actually produce the fruit and so after they've grown up and they begin to to uh, tie those things down they come in sometimes and they have to pull some of the vegetation off and pull the suckers y'all ever pull suckers off your tomato plant Sometimes you got to do a little pruning. And they throw all that stuff down in the row, you know, and kind of walk over it. And 80% of the growth from the year before, I mean, that's a lot of pruning. And when I look at my own Christian life, my own faith walk, pruning is something that doesn't happen when I'm comfortable and when everything is going right. Pruning is something that happens that brings me closer to God. So those crises or those challenges, those things where you, you have a conundrum and you can't quite get over the hump with it. Now, uh, last week I talked to you guys about going to the uh, dermatologist and having some pathology. And we prayed that the pathology was going to come back. And I was really hoping that it was going to come back negative, but it came back positive. Now, it's just nothing, you know... No real anxiety, although I'll, I'll admit I had some anxiety over that because the course of treatment they're going to use is a topical chemotherapy that I've used before, and I know this can be uncomfortable. I know my lips are going to peel, and that place may get really raw, and I'm going to have to do it for a month. Thankfully, she said I'm not going to have to do it for a month all at one time because likely there wouldn't be anything left to put anything on if it were because it's pretty rough stuff. What I'm telling you is that that's God's way of pruning me, of getting me to a place where I understand what's really important, what my priorities are. Now, my family had a little bit of anxiety about this, didn't you guys? They had anxiety when I told them about the pathology, the, the test, and they had anxiety when I told them it was positive. But we're going to get through this, right? But why are we going to get through this? Because God is with us. Now, to take that a step further, the reason they're so anxious, the kids just lost their grandmother to cancer a few weeks ago. And their mom is undergoing treatment for breast cancer right now. Y'all need to pray for them because it's a tough one. Y'all need to pray for me because it's going to be tough for me too. I'm, I'm got, I've got to speak at an a, a honors banquet on Tuesday at the academy, so I'm not going to start the treatment until after that. I don't, I don't want to, I don't know. I just, I, I made a commitment I'm going to live into. It's a good way for me to procrastinate just a couple of more days. When, when 
Jesus talks about abiding. It's real. We make it hard, but it's real simple. It's just staying close to God. It's picking up that dusty Bible that maybe has been sitting there, maybe even have a magazine or a couple other books on top of it on our nightstand, dusting that off and opening it up and actually reading it for ourselves. You can tune in to the encounter the words that I set out every day, and you can get the lectionary. I'll read that for you. And you can hear a couple of good hints, but you need to learn how to open this up and look at it for yourself. And you need to pray. You need to pray with your kids. You need to pray with your spouse. Because sooner or later, one of you, all of you, are going to go through a crisis in your own life. And you're going to want to be close to God. And you're going to want Him to hear your prayers. And He's going to say, abide in me, and I will abide in you. And we all want to bear fruit. I want to bear fruit. Do you want to bear fruit? This is what fruit looks like. This is Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there's no law. That's, that's the fruit that, that needs to be coming in our lives. But we need to understand there's some pruning coming. Okay? There's some pruning coming. But it's, it's an it's a organic or organic, intimate relationship. It's not religion. It's a relationship. Amen? In the name of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn. <laughs>